All right, so this talk is how not to use Cassandra. And my name is Axel Lillingkrans, and I'm a dog person. And that's all I'm going to say about myself. Uh, so uh, a little bit about the company I work for called Spotify. Uh, we are a company that are, looks like we're either ridiculously huge or tiny, depending on if you're Google or not. So we have around 4,000 servers. Uh, we have a catalog of roughly 12 soccer fields of music. Uh, we stream about four Wikipedias of uh, music per second to our 24 million active users. Um, we accomplish this through a backend of 70 services or so. Most of these are written in Python. A few are written in Java one in C++, uh, but yeah, mostly Python and Java shop. Uh, as pretty much anyone who ha isn't a spectacular failure is doing, we write uh, many small, simple services. We try to keep them responsible for one thing and one thing only, and sometimes we fail, and that's when uh, we get really badly functioning services. So. Back when we started out, uh, we were pretty much exclusively a Postgres shop. And we have a really good experience with Postgres. It's, it's a system that works very, very well. But once we started hitting a really large scale sometime around when we, were, when we uh, moved to the US as well, uh, we were starting to get a lot of problems. Um, Postgres has, compared to, say, Cassandra, very poor cross-site replication support. If uh, you get a network outage or a net split or something, then uh, getting back in sync again will, is a painful process that often requires manual intervention, and that's not something you want to do on a regular basis. And of course, if you need more than one node in your cluster to handle more, more load, then sharding will throw out most of the relational advantages out the window. So for a certain workload, we, know, we felt that we can't really use Postgres anymore. So a little bit more than two years ago, we started playing around a bit with Cassandra. And by now, we have something, something like 24 services that use it, uh, 300 Cassandra nodes. We store something like 50 terabytes of data. So overall, a pretty heavy Cassandra user. Um, back when we started using Cassandra, there wasn't that much information out available about how to use Cassandra, how to design your schemas, stuff like that. So we really managed to screw things up a lot. And that was quite boring. I, you guys here, most of you don't have the same good excuses we can do. I mean, there was this really good talk this morning by Patrick from Datastax about modeling. If you didn't manage to catch it, you should see it online because everyone needs to know these things. Um, but I'm also going to be talking a little bit about what not to do. So this brings us to the actual subject of our talk. And the first part about how not to use Cassandra is this, how, not, how to misconfigure Cassandra. So, uh, Rick from Instagram just talked a little bit about read repair, which is a interesting and often very useful feature. Um, with read repair enabled, whenever you do a read, you, uh, even if you do it with a consistency level of one, it will send the request to all nodes in the cluster. And uh, if you have a consistency level of one, once the first one replies, you send back the reply and everything is fine, but it will still keep waiting for the other ones, and just check that the digests of the hashes match, and um, that way make sure that everything is uh, consistent. And if not, it will merge and do the right things and just repair whatever damage you have. This sounds like a pretty neat feature, right? Should be no problem with doing this. Any opposition here? Anyone who would? Oh, OK. So it's. An interesting feature of read repair is that it is performed across uh, all data centers. So if you, say, have a read repair uh, factor set to one in a multi-DC setup, every single read request will send something like half a dozen requests 
uh, across the Atlantic Ocean, and that can get boring quite quickly. So uh, we have made this mistake multiple times, and it was equally boring every time. And in Cassandra 1.1, there is finally a uh, DC local read repair configuration item so that you can configure there to only be read repair inside of your data center, which is probably the only type of read repair that should be allowed to exist. OK, so another cool thing in Cassandra is the row cache. You guys all know about the key cache, right? That's we store individual parts of the indices to speed up things so that you don't have to go to the disk, look at the index file, and so on. Well, the row cache is even cooler. You, you can store an entire result there so that if you hit the row cache, then you will not touch the SS tables, not touch disk. You can fulfill one request entirely out of memory. This was intended as something of a memcache alternative. If you guys are putting memcached in front of Cassandra for performance purposes, you can just stop doing that and switch to enabling row cache, and everything will just be faster, and you won't have to worry about consistency and cache invalidation, because that will just be handled transparently by Cassandra. Pretty awesome, right? Right? What do you say? Awesome. Perfect. So you're toast. <laughs> So the thing about the row cache is that it only stores entire rows ever. Uh, that means if you are doing a GET request on a single column, uh, that read, if it's a cache miss, will become promoted into a full row slice. And if you have big rows, that means your performance will probably go down by at least one, maybe two orders of magnitude. And that can be bad. And to make things even more interesting, whenever you write to a row, that is also cache invalidated, just thrown out the window. So in conclusion, never, ever, ever use the row cache unless you know all of your data usage patterns or you will just destroy your performance. And we have accidentally enabled row cache every once in a while on a few services and just wondered why the hell did the performance just go down like that. So that's a good thing to know. So another cool useful feature in Cassandra is compression. And this is really nice with Cassandra. You can just toggle a switch, and Cassandra will start compressing all of your SS tables. Uh, the, uh, the compression algorithm in, in this case, Snappy, is really super fast. You can uh, compress and decompress like a hundred times more than, than data than Cassandra can deliver per, per second because it's almost no overhead. So it's really super fast and efficient. And you could probably just enable it. Uh, and well, you will have less data on this, the reads will be slower and smaller, and pretty much things should just be faster, right? Right? Uh, yeah, perfect. Cool. Wrong. <laughs> so the problem with compression is that there are a bunch of fast paths in the Cassandra code base. The most obvious one being that you can enable a mapping of your files into RAM, which means that you don't have to do a whole series of context switching and stuff like that, and seeking and other boring stuff. But there's also some fast paths when it comes to indexes and so on. And all of these things are disabled when you use compression. You will not notice this if you are using uh, something slow, something that hits the disk most of the time, and something that's like a slow uh, data set. But if you actually are handling uh, thousands of requests per node per second, or even hundreds, you will get a quite severe performance degradation, and, and you will once again be a sad panda. Okay, so that's it for how to misconfigure Cassandra, and I would, I'm now going to move into different interesting ways to misuse Cassandra. And overall, an interesting property of Cassandra is that when you install Cassandra on a few nodes and you load up some data, it will pretty universally be very speedy. It will, it will do requests in no time at all. Um, the, the problem starts to, to occur once you have written a lot of data over time 
uh, basically the, your write patterns, the temporal write patterns, if you keep writing more data to the same row, then that row will move into more and more and more SS tables. And once a single row is spread out over many SS tables, that's when you get bad performance. So you start off fine and then you degrade slowly. And this can be something like half a year or a year or even several years before it starts to stabilize and you get uh, the, the kind of performance you can expect moving forward. Uh, and this can be something of a problem. So to know if you are in this, uh, in this situation or not, uh, there's this really useful and hard to decrypt tool called CF histograms. It's part of Node Tool. And what you can do with Node Tool CF histograms is basically find out how many SS tables are my reads touching. So whenever I do a read, how many different seeks does the disk probably have to make and so on. You can also find the, the time distribution and a bunch of other really useful things. So I would strongly recommend to anyone who has to do any kind of performance work with Cassandra to really get to know CF histograms because uh, there is a huge amount of very useful information tucked into that window that kind of looks like a matrix blah, with, with just a bunch of numbers. So know it and love it. Um, one thing that we have done at Spotify is uh, a patch to uh, make sure that for every single SS table, you, you store the smallest and the largest column name written to any row in that SS table. And this means for specifically for things that are or look like time series data, where you have a very sharp time partitioning, you will get awesome performance increases if you're using size tier compaction. You will see that every single read you do will only have to touch the SS tables where your data is all actually located. So I promise you, I promised my coworker Marcus that I wouldn't make anyone applaud for him, but Marcus wrote that and it's a really useful patch. So don't applaud or anything, but he's awesome. <laughs> all right. So another thing that uh, we have uh, encountered in Cassandra is the problem that we are one of the few Cassandra users that use big uh, traffic and big sets of data that are spread across the Atlantic or across a large ping chasm, basically. So there aren't many cross-continent Cassandra users. Uh, which means that we have been more or less on our own when it comes to a bunch of in issues that you only encounter then. Uh, we wrote a patch, and when I say we, I don't mean the, the majestic plural maestralis we, I mean Marcus, uh, wrote a patch to disable TCP no delay so that uh, when you are writing uh, very quickly, you will actually try to batch up multiple writes in the TCP network stack and that reduced our uh, packet count by 20%. And uh, this was a huge improvement for our poor old uh, uh, firewalls that had a very hard time keeping up with all of the packets that Cassandra was sending. So that was also a nice patch. All right, so the next subject here will be how not to, <laughs> how not to upgrade Cassandra. I love this image, who doesn't? I mean, it's Beautiful. Um, and one thing that should be noted here about Cassandra, I'm, I'm being kind of mean. I'm saying mean things about how much Cassandra sucks. I'm saying mean things about how stupid we are and bad at using Cassandra. But an, an important thing to note here is that we have never, ever lost any data with Cassandra. We have hits every major bug that Cassandra's ever had probably. We have had so many pains and back in the 06, 07 days Cassandra was really buggy back then and still we never lost any data. And that is probably due to uh, the mutableness of the SS tables and the append only uh, way that uh, compactions and, and everything works. So because of these properties, Cassandra is really something that in spite of being a new and immature product compared to things that have been around for a few decades like Oracle or Postgres or MySQL or whatever, it, we still 
have decided to trust it with our data and we haven't ever had to regret that decision. Anyway, so let's go back to being mean. Um, <laughs> the upgrade from 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 was the first major upgrade of a production cluster we did. And uh, everyone on the internet said that, oh, rolling upgrades just work. Take down your cluster, upgrade it, and start it about back up again, and everything will be super awesome. And it was not. Uh, there was, in fact, a bug that meant that uh, it failed to start up and nothing worked. So we downgraded, and we located the problem. We wrote a patch. We submitted the patch, and uh, everything worked. And you would expect that, given that we upgraded to 086, someone else would have already discovered this problem and tried it out. And that turned out, obviously, to be uh, the wrong conclusion. So our takeaway was to always try rolling upgrades in a testing environment before doing it in production, and never believe what people tell you on the internet. <laughs> By the way, if you are watching this uh, on like YouTube or some kind of streaming over the internet, you can make an exception to me because I am a very trustworthy person even on the internet. <laughs> okay, so the next upgrade we did was from 0.8 to 1.0. And uh, wise from our previous experience, we upgraded first in a test environment. Everything worked fine. And then we tried it in production and everything worked fine. We learn from our mistakes, don't we? Except for the last cluster. And once we upgraded there, all of the data was gone. No keys, no nothing. It was just empty, just gone. And this was the, uh, around the time where pants were shat. So anyway, uh, what we did was that, well, what happened was that for very large clusters, there was a bug with the Bloom filter code. And it made Cassandra f think that uh, the bloom filter was somehow dead and empty, which meant if the bloom filter is empty, that means there's nothing there. So every read you would do, you would check the cluster and it would say, no, no data there. And so everything was just gone. We did a data scrub and the data was back and everything was fine and dandy and we were on the road again. So uh, the takeaway from that is when you do a, a test upgrade, do it with production data. <laughs> All right, so the upgrade from 1.0 to 1.1. Uh, after all of the previous experiences, we did the test with production data in a testing environment. Everything worked. Um, <laughs> Then we did exactly the same steps all over again. I noticed people giggling, so if you're reading ahead of my slides. <laughs> uh, and some nodes, well, some services were reporting missing data. And we're not talking about empty data this time. It was just like, well, half the data is there, half the data is gone, and some things are all inconsistent and weird. So we scrubbed all of the data, restarted, and everything was well again. And since then, we have never been able to reproduce the problem. We actually snapshotted the SS tables of the, the Cassandra clusters before we, we did the scrub. So we have the exact files exhibiting the problems before. And when we move those over to, to a new server uh, to, to just try and reproduce, everything just works. We don't know. This might have been a classical problem exists between keyboard and chair because we have worked really hard to reproduce this. And well, so the takeaway from this is that we are really, really looking forward to the 1.2 upgrade. <laughs> All right. So uh, next uh, next topic will be how not to delete, how not to deal with large clusters. There's this cool thing in Cassandra called a coordinator. So a co coordinator is the thing that, that performs partitioning, that passes on requests to the right number of nodes for your consistency level and so on, and does the synchronization and checking the digests, all of these things. And what happens in Cassandra if a single node decides to be super slow 
And when I mean slow, I mean slow, not dead, because there's this thing called the snitch in Cassandra that will notice, oh, this guy is dead, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take him out, and I'm not going uh, to send data here. But if a node is slow, and there can be many reasons why this would happen. One of our Spotify favorites is bad RAID, you know, RAID controller batteries, because you have to replace your RAID controller batteries roughly once a year, because if you don't, then they will switch to a slower mode because they are afraid you can no longer cache writes as much because then you might lose data that you say you have F-synced and so on. So, so that can, can slow you down. And well, apparently we suck at replacing our batteries. Um, another reason for, for sudden slowness can be just bursts of compaction, so repairs or something or a bursty load, or a network hiccup, or maybe you're doing a major garbage collection. In reality, slowness happens in a 60 node cluster, or a 100 node cluster, or whatever. Maybe you barely ever encounter it with three nodes, but in a big cluster, this will be a thing that will happen many times a day. So, let's go back to talking. What exactly happens if one node then is slow? Well, it turns out that the coordinator that I mentioned before, it has a request queue. And uh, this request queue is shared between all nodes that it talks to. So uh, basically, the queue will just start filling up with more and more and requ request this one single slow node. And the queue will become full. And then you will have, if you have a 60 node cluster, you will have one node that's paused and 59 nodes that uh, aren't receiving any traffic because all of the coordinator queues are full. Does, has anyone ever told you that Cassandra has no single point of failure? <laughs> because they fucking lied. <laughs> We have actually noticed several situations like that. So, so there, I mean, in general, it is true, but there are lots and lots of situations where, where you will encounter failures that make that more uh, optimistic hope that, than a fact of life. So one way to solve this particular single point of failure is to use a partitioner-aware client that is a client that knows the partitioning schema and knows where all of the data is located so that when the client sends a request, it will only send a request to one of the nodes that actually holds the data. This is actually also a performance improvement because uh, then there will be less cross-node chatter and you can talk within the, uh, within the same process and things will be slightly faster. But mostly I would say it's a re reliability improvement. And this means that at most, because of things like this, three nodes can go down instead of the entire cluster, and that's quite a big improvement. And uh, Astyanax, the, the Java uh, client for Cassandra, has this feature. And you should always use Astyanax. You should not use Hectors, among other things, because of this. So a big shout out to Netflix for writing an awesome Cassandra client there. All right. Our next topic is how not to delete data. And I could just make this really short and say don't delete data, but let's go into some more detail. Uh, specifically, uh, the way Cassandra deletes data is kind of messy. The reason, of course, being the much, uh, much valued immutableness of SS tables. If once data hits disk, you never ever write or mutate that SS table again, how can you remove data from it? The obvious way to do it is through tombstones. That is that you put in a write with the same column value as, uh, as the previous thing that you're trying to delete and some kind of special flag saying, this is a tombstone, so this data has been deleted. And this is what Cassandra does. And, well, tombstones are basically any other column writes. They, they have the same type of timestamps for, for versioning and so on. So we can look at them as any other write that can overwrite other writes and so on. And the question then becomes, tombstones are kind of special, right? I mean, they are things that we would like to go away. Once the original data is gone, then the tombstones can go away too. So does that actually ever happen? Well, 
the answer is, and this is uh, really complicated to reason about, um, tombstones can get merged into the SS tables that hold the original data, and finally the tombstones then can become redundant. But, uh, and also, once that has happened, because of the, uh, the possibility that some nodes in the cluster have gone down and they might come up, there's also a grace time. So even if you have no more true non-tombstone values for something, you still have to keep the tombstone around for a certain grace time, something like 31 days or so. But after that has happened, well, during a minor compaction, uh, tombstones, I'm, I'm going to have to read this because it's so complicated, to, at least to me, to express. Uh, tombstones can only be deleted if all values for the specified row are all being compacted. So if you have perf uh, performed writes to the same row as the column you're trying to delete in at some point in time, and it has hit an SS table that you're not currently compacting, then that column can never go away. And this is the important difference here, because maybe you only wrote to that, to that specific column once and then deleted it. And that doesn't matter, because if that column is in a row that is kind of popular, that gets written to every once in a while, then that tombstone will pretty much never, ever going away. With size tier com compaction, it's just not going to happen. So let's talk a little bit more about level compaction, because level compaction is the savior of Cassandra. It removes so many degenerate cases from Cassandra, and it really improves the read performance by such a huge margin that maybe it fixes this as well. And in theory, it should, uh, because in theory, they say that uh, 90% of all rows live in a single SS table with Cassandra. And this is assuming a bunch of this and that about the, the distribution of rights and the distributions of this and that. What we've found in our production clusters is that somewhere between 50 and 80%, depending on, on the type of, of data we're storing, between 50 and 80% of all reads only hit one SS table. The other hit multiple SS tables. And that's generally not good enough uh, because if you think about it in with a leveled compaction, when you're doing a leveled compaction, you will only ever uh, be compacting two separate SS tables that hold the same data space because of the partitioning scheme used in, in leveled compaction. So uh, the result of this is if you're doing a lot of writes to a specific row, then that row will exist in all or most of the levels in uh, the level compaction scheme. And if that's the case, then the tombstones will stick around because you won't be uh, compacting all of the levels at the same time, and the tombstones will stick around. So even with level compaction, this can definitely still be a problem. The conclusion that you should take away from this is that deletions in Cassandra are super messy. And the only surefire way to get away from, from tombstones is to do major compactions. And as you probably know, they have their own huge set of problems. So um, also, the problem will generally be much more pop problem bigger with, pro with the popular rows, so that all of the rows that you don't care about, if you have a very skewed workload, will have no tombstones. But the ones that you really need to be quick, they will be slow. Um, avoid schemas that delete data. So all of the smart people will now be thinking, well, what about TTL data? Uh, once the TTL of a uh, column expires, uh, you can just compact it away. You know that you don't need it. You know that there's no resurrection thing. You don't need a tombstone, right? So we don't need the data anymore. Uh, we can just drop it and TTL data will be super fast, right? Come on, yeah, right? Yeah, awesome, cool. No. Okay. So. The reasoning here is that, well, what if you write a column with a non-TTL'd 
uh, with, without the TTL. And then you overwrite that same column with a piece of TTL data. Once the TTL data expires, if you haven't happened to do a compaction on the old non-TTL data, then that might reappear. And that would be so terrible, right? So because of this very esoteric use case where people are writing the same values into the same column family, sometimes with and sometimes without TTLs, they decided to do the whole tombstone singing, song and dance thing that breaks everything, even for TTL data. And so TTLs will not help you at all. It will just not. One thing that does help you, though, is that once again, my amazing coworker, Marcus, has written a patch. What it does is that it records if all you have in a specific SS table is TTL data, and uh, it will record all the expiry date of the last thing to expire in that entire SS table. So that when you're about to do a compaction, you can notice that, hey, all of the data in this SS table has already expired. Then you can just drop the SS table. You, just a simple unlink, unlink, order one operation. Pretty awesome, right? Pretty awesome. And this will, of course, mostly work well when you have TTL data that is short-lived, because if you have long-lived TTL data, like six months or whatever, then those uh, you will have merged a bunch of things in different sizes and blah, 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 and you will have you will most likely have some new data in there and it, won't, it will not work as well, but it's a good start. All right, I'm going to go back a little bit more about cool ways to fail at using Cassandra. Specifically, I'm going to go into a very specific way to fail with Cassandra, which is our playlist service. Now, this is a really big service. We have something like one billion playlists in there. Uh, we are receiving a load of somewhere around 40,000 reads per second, a few hundred writes per second, uh, 22 terabytes of data compressed, some, almost double if you uncompress it. So this is a large data set. And we had an old playlist service that stored everything on disk as files. Um, and that was a really interesting design choice because one billion files has a bunch of drawbacks, one of which being that it's really slow to back up 100 million files or a billion files or whatever. Uh, we had to resort to sorting the, 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 all of the files in inode order so that we can read them out in roughly sequential order during backups, or otherwise it would just say, take several weeks. Even that didn't help us after a while because uh, we had so many files that we just had a long period of time where we had no backups for one of our most important core services. But that was in the old days when, when we were a lot smaller and more naive and knew less. So, so well, anyway, uh, we also had a homebrewed replication model that basically combined the, wor the worst of all the worlds. If a single node went down, we lost data, but we still had to write to a bunch of machines and, was, and so on. And so it was very, it was an interesting time. Uh, we had frequent downtimes back then. None of our users really noticed this so much. Uh, anyway, we figured that this would be the perfect test case for Cassandra. Let's take our most important piece of user-generated data, and let's just, and we have so, so many problems, let's just use that as a test bed for an entirely untested, cool new product you know, that we don't know anything about. <laughs> All right. Here's an interesting thing that not a lot of people know about the Spotify playlists. Every playlist is actually a revisioned object. You can basically think about it as a slightly simplified Git repository. It's a distributed versioning, version control system. Um, the reason for this is that you have the use case that you say that you own two mobile telephones and you go offline on both because you're going to Cambodia. And then you try to update the same playlist 
on both devices simultaneously or well during the same vacation and then when you come back to to the united states from your lovely vacation you go online and while you obviously need those changes from both devices to be correctly merged into a single coherent history so that you can see all of these changes on both machines right yeah that's a really useful feature said no one ever <laughs> On a side note, though, it should be noted that this is a design decision that has kind of managed to save us from ourselves, because this is obviously in many ways silly, but on the plus side, it, uh, whenever the playlist system would go down, well, people were having these revisioned object things in their uh, clients, and they wouldn't actually notice all that much unless they had multiple devices uh, which people didn't back in the old days usually, they wouldn't notice that uh, the playlists weren't syncing to the servers uh, because, well, it just kept on working so long as you were only using one device. And if you were using multiple devices, then the only thing was that for a few days you couldn't see the edits from one device and another, and no one actually cares about that. So, let's talk a bit more about this uh, playlist data model. Um, well, it's a revision system, so what we store, the authoritative data, is a sequence of changes. Uh, every, we store a bunch of other things, and, but that's basically just optimizations. Uh, and Cassandra is really neat at storing this kind of data because uh, we know usually what the key is, uh, that is the revision ID of everything. That's something we look up on. And that means we can always do uh, reads with a consistency level of one, because either we will get back the correct result or we will get back nothing, because it hasn't, that column hasn't been written to yet. And if we get back nothing, we can just issue a new read with a higher consistency level and we'll get the data. So that's a pretty cool use case for Cassandra right there. Anyway, this is a rendering from a web interface of how a playlist actually looks. You can see here that here we have a fork with a bunch of concurrent modifications that are, have then been merged. Simple stuff. Anyway, so we have had huge amounts of issues with playlists and Cassandra. Uh, I'm going to mostly be talking about one of them, uh, which had to do with the head column family. Now, the head column family stores something very much akin to the head in Git, that is, the pointer to the latest revision ID. And uh, this serves actually somewhere around 90% of all requests to the playlist service. The reason being that whenever a client logs in, it will say, I have this version of this playlist. What is the latest version? And then usually no one else has modified the playlist in question, and it will just get back, oh, you have the latest version. Cool. And if you get a mismatch, then you will have to figure out and read the, the changes that have happened since and things like that. But 90% of the time, you have the latest version, so all you need to do is access head. It should be noticed. That, uh, oh, well, it should be noted here that uh, we actually, for a long time, memlocked uh, head into RAM because it was so frequently used and we had performance uh, issues because of page cache miss misses and so on. And this is something that might be a good idea to do depending on your use case. So, but what I uh, will talk about now is that even though we had head locked completely into RAM so that accessing head was known to never ever cause disk IO, we noticed that there were requests that actually took several seconds to complete. And we could just reproduce this in the Cassandra CLI. We would issue a get to the right, uh, to the right uh, uh, row, and what we would get back was 15 seconds of waiting before getting the data. So what we did was that we uh, copied those SS tables to a development machine for investigation, and we converted them to J JSON uses, using the SS table to JSON format. And what we noticed was that some rows contained around 600,000 tombstones. So that's cool. <laughs> Why? Well, we, it turns out that the way we store data in head 
is that we stored the revision ID of the latest revision in the column name and have an empty column value. Why do we do this? Because when we do two simultaneous writes, remember your uh, lovely vacation to Cambodia, when we do that, we want there to be we don't want the writes to clobber each other. So when that happens, when you do two syncs like that, you will simply end up with two values in the head column family. And then when you do a read, you do a slice request ac across everything in head, and you will almost always get back just the one result. If you get back two results, then you know, oops, I need to do a merge, and then you will do that. So it's just a fork detection thing. Uh, but, of course, this turned out to not be a really optimal thing for Cassandra to store. We hadn't really thought about this. We designed this, like I said, two plus years ago, back when we didn't know everything about Cassandra. We still don't know everything about Cassandra, but we do know more about Cassandra. We didn't realize that, well, if you keep writing to the same row, then there, there will be values for that row in a bunch of different SS tables, and then the tombstones in, can, in fact, never be compacted away. So for all of our most popular playlists, uh, we still had something like, this was a half a year ago, so, so back then we had something like 1.5 years worth of tombstones. And that was boring. Um, our solution to this, which is a bit oddball, is to perform major compactions. Because with a major compaction, you are actually merging all of the SS tables. And what that means is that you know for a fact that you don't have any stray other things. So if there is no value for a specific uh, column, then you can just delete the tombstone. So that's the only plausible way to, to safely remove tombstones. And we did that. And things started looking up, and things were speedy again for about a week until we noticed that everything was slow again. So that was boring. Why? Well, it turns out that we were running repairs in between the major compactions. <laughs> so that was an interesting situation. Uh, we solved this by doing repairs on weekdays and major compactions on weekends. And um, hopefully you will already know that uh, you should never ever use Cassandra to store a queue. And of course, if you think about it, the head column family was a queue that always tried to hold only one value in the work queue, but still some kind of queue. And just Cassandra is terrible at storing queues. Don't do that. OK, so another interesting Cassandra feature, the Cassandra distributed counters. So in the Spotify UI, there are a bunch of things that we want to count. We want to count how many people are following a playlist. We want to count how many people are following an artist. How many times has this song been streamed, this kind of thing. And the distributed counters in Cassandra are supposed to solve this and just transparently just count things and it will bump and everything will just work. So is this awesome? Yeah, yeah, sure. Is there anyone from DataStax here in the room? So do you think it works? <laughs> Care to take a... <laughs> so... He doesn't want to guess. Well, and, <laughs> well anyway, the uh, distributed counters in Cassandra have gotten a really bad reputation, mostly because they don't actually count things very well. <laughs> but uh, for us, they work pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> See, the thing here is, it, we, if we have a million listens to a particular stream, and Cassandra is saying 998,000 or 105,000. We don't care. <laughs> the really important thing here, and this is something YouTube has not realized, is that if I click reload, then the number has to go up by one. 
and that will pretty much work with distributed counters. It can be off by a bunch of things, and sometimes it will go up by a thousand or down by a thousand, but no one cares. So long it's, it's not the same number, then people will just be happy. And <laughs> So, look, another dog picture. I wonder how that got in there. Anyway, so how not to fail. And I should note here that this is only a partial list. One thing that you should do if you want to use Cassandra at scale is you should treat it as a utility belt. This is a set of really well-tested, cool, interesting algorithms. If you don't know what the algorithms do, you will poke it and you will lose a finger and you will be sad. <laughs> but if you know what the algorithms do and what they do well and what they do poorly, then you can put together a very interesting storage system that will solve your problems in a very efficient and cool manner. Also, flash storage is completely awesome. Um, we do a lot of one-off things. I main, mentioned most of these, but I'm just going to reiterate. We do a, a bunch of really weird things in our cluster. We have clusters where we do major compactions on a weekly basis. We have clusters where we will delete all of the data, physically delete the, the SS tables, and just recreate things from scratch. We memlock frequently used SS tables into RAM. We, we do weird things. And you need, to, you need to understand what the algorithms are. You need to understand what the performance profile of the things are. If you don't, when you hit scale, you will be very sad. And this is actually a, a stark difference between Cassandra and, say, Postgres. In Postgres, the things that Postgres does well, it does well, and the things Postgres does poorly, it does okay. Cassandra is really good at the things it does well, and it's terrible at the things it does badly. So you need to keep that in mind. And that pretty much goes for all the SQL things, uh, all the old school databases. And so, um, Cassandra read performance is heavily dependent on the temporal patterns of your writes. Specifically, if you write to the same row over a pro um, prolonged period of time, you will get bad performance. Also, Cassandra is initially snappy, but it, performance for bad use cases will go down slowly over time. And this is an important point. This makes benchmarking Cassandra close to useless. We have all seen a bunch of really optimistic slides about MongoDB is faster, Cassandra is faster, or whatever is faster. All of these benchmarks are pretty much useless because they didn't actually run that benchmark for two years before try measuring things. They ran it for like a week or something, and that's not relevant. That just shows you off what Cassandra will do for the first few months. So don't believe in the benchmarks. Okay, uh, what else? Don't delete data. Um, and see if histograms is your friend. Um, also, there is still a bunch of esoteric problems working with large-scale Cassandra installations. I think the next few years in storage are going to be super interesting because we've probably gotten roughly as much performance as we can out of using Flash in the format of SSDs that still use the SOT or whatever protocol. In order to really start reaping benefits, we will have to come up with new hardware protocols to talk to storage. We will suddenly have really cool new abilities when the database products can go down and manipulate things in the lower layers, and we are in for a really interesting time in the next few years. And if you agree with that statement, you should totally come work with us because we're going to have a blast. So spotify.com slash jobs. Uh, I think there's supposed to be a microphone somewhere around here if anyone wants to ask a question. So there's a hand in there, and there's a man with a microphone. This seems like a good fit. It's right here, 2-2. Two, two. Yeah, 
first, let me say uh, thank you. <laughs> this is great stuff. Um, let's see, one, uh, something it seems fairly obvious to me, another single point of failure, I'm curious to know if you've had problems. Um, the reliance on NTP seems um, a little bit scary. And I wonder if you've had any problems in that area at all. That is absolutely a valid thing. We have not really had any major problems with that, but I can imagine that a bunch of people would have, yes. We've, in our environment, we have distributed systems that are dependent on time, and we've had a million problems with NTP. Mm. And so um, our environment doesn't yet include Cassandra, but it will soon. And so this worries me that we'll start to see new problems related to that. But, uh, you really need your NTP uh, infrastructure to work reasonably well in order to use Cassandra, otherwise you will yeah. be sad. Yeah, that's my impression. Okay, yep. thank you. All right, there's, uh, yeah, maybe we should make a line there and just move everyone who wants to ask a question, get in line behind the, the lady with, with a microphone. So, so I was curious about, um, about when you were talking about when you write very fre frequently to a row, the deletions don't get deleted. Yeah. Um, so does that, does that mean that you need to rethink your data model? Uh, or, or is there is there a way that you can still have you know you, because um, I'm trying to think of an example so like with a user column family you're always going to have the same set of users you don't you don't really change that uh, the row key very often so so would the correct thing to go through delete the entire row and then rewrite it every now and then or or uh, coming up with a new way of indexing. I would say that in general, if you have performance problems with Cassandra, you probably need to switch your data schema. Uh, specifically in the case of uh, a, the user row, if you're deleting columns in your user database, then what on earth are you doing? You should not do that. If you have the need to remove and add columns a bunch of times, you should probably serialize all of that data into some kind of binary blob or whatever, protobuf, JSON, I don't really care, and then put that into a, a column with a constant name. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes, go to the microphone. Aha, someone else came in front. Earlier in the presentation, you mentioned that uh, compression disables a, uh, a set of fast read parts. Uh, how would you detect that, and how do you address that? So what's the question, how you detect that? Yeah, like how would you, so let's say I turn on compression, and uh, there are certain read parts that might not be as efficient. Uh, is that a significant difference that will help me catch it, or it's something that, uh, that I wouldn't notice? And, and it's been a significant difference for us in some column families, and we are happily using compression in other column families. So the way to detect that is to uh, turn on compression and measure the performance difference. Once again, no tool see if histograms is your friend, because it will show not only the average access time, but also the distribution, and it will give you quite a bit of data. So you have a lot of data at your fingertips. Just notice, is this a problem for me or not? Okay. Cool, thanks. You're welcome. Hey, hi. Uh, so basically, uh, to handle these Tombstone Tom problem, right? So have you looked at writing your own co compaction strategy? So Cassandra, the compaction strategy is pluggable, right? So, so since you seem to have submitted a couple of patches to Cassandra, right? So what is your, exp have you looked at it and what is your experience with that? Was the question in whether we have thought about writing our own compaction strategies? Right. Uh, and the answer is definitely yes. Uh, my awesome coworker, Marcus, who's still sitting over there <laughs> and who turns redder every time I mention him, he has a plan for a very useful compaction strategy which is based on time. It's for time series data. So you basically just compact things that have happened concurrently and that will make for very efficient uh, usage with specifically time series data because you will always have, you will never have to for any given 
time point check more than one SS table if you, what you're storing is time series data. So uh, we have also thought about a bunch of different things. Honestly though, leveled compaction is a really, really clever thing. It's, uh, it solves a bunch of problems with size tier compaction. I don't think people in general understand how it works well enough. I'm probably going to, at some future conference, try and do a talk on exactly how it works because I find that most people know that it's something about sharding or whatever, but it, it's a very good thing and it has some drawbacks, but if you know about them, you can often work around them and it's, it's a very interesting uh, compaction strategy. You were mentioning about scrubbing the data. What do you mean uh, by that? There is, I think it's a no tool command called scrub. Oh, and this is a scrub, okay. Yeah, and basically what scrub will do, it will delete the index, it will delete the uh, bloom filters, and it will regenerate that, and it will regenerate all of the SS tables from scratch so, so that it just makes sure that your data is uh, in a consistent good state. And uh, one last thing is the, you were, mentioning uh, sometime you have to reload the data into the cluster, and what's the reason for doing that? Well, f obviously if, well, what we want to do there is basically we want to replace all of the old data. We have data and we regenerate it from scratch every mm -hmm. day, and if we would just insert it, then the old data would have to be compacted away. Because we are just deleting the SS tables, we can turn off compaction entirely. We can just write the data and be happy, and that works very well for us for, for that use case. I would like to add to the previous question about writing our own compaction strategies that I also suspect that once we have uh, cooler access to, to Flash, we can do some really, really interesting things when it comes to, to new compaction strategies. But that's in the future. Hi, I had another question. Cool. Um, so I, I was wondering, so generally, generally when, you set up, um, when you set up your standard cluster, you, you make room to duplicate all of your data. Is that a problem for Spotify? I, I would imagine that you wouldn't want to um, duplicate that much data if you can if you can sort of merge it into into some form you could use and if so how do you handle user access levels across regions that is a very good question and i cannot give you a short answer uh, better than it varies we have <laughs> very many different services and they all have different storage needs and we really try not to stay away from doing any kind of one-size-fits-all solutions. We have some data that lives only in one data center. We have some that is replicated to all data centers. We are moving towards making more and more data home-sited so that it's located only in the data center where the user accesses it the most, but mm -hmm. we're not doing that a lot currently because we tried to do it and we failed spectacularly. Um, but I don't think that there can be a good one answer to that. It depends on how much writes you're seeing, how big your data set is, uh, and a bunch of other factors. Also, of course, how much data in question is shared between people. So. It's a really complex question, and I don't think there's a one single good answer. Sorry about that. Thanks. You're welcome. OK, there don't seem to be any more questions. So thank you so much for your time. And I hope <laughs>